from your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm Jim Margulis, managing editor of SoxMachine.com, and this is a special weekend edition of the Sox Machine Podcast because I'll be joined by Keith Law of The Athletic to talk about new White Sox general manager, Chris Getz. In the wake of the firings of Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn, Keith wrote a great article at The Athletic published on August 23rd about the player development failures of the White Sox. Yet when somebody raised the idea of Chris Getz as the next general manager in the comments of that article, Keith said, quote, I like Chris Getz quite a bit and think he would do well if he actually had the autonomy to do the job, unquote, which is to say if he'd be free of Jerry Reinsdorf's meddling. As somebody who is a Get skeptic and hopes to be proven wrong, I wanted to have Keith on to ask him about the distinction between the individual and the organization, and then sneak in a bunch of other questions about how more normal teams operate. As always, he's more than generous with his time. Keith, thanks for joining the Sox Machine Podcast. Normally, you join the Sox Machine Podcast before the season talking about your top prospect list, all the work you do preseason, but you're joining us because it is a time of both momentous change for the White Sox and also momentous staying the same, I guess you could call it, because they promoted (laughs) from within. And so we don't exactly know what to make of it. So we brought you on to help uh, us sort it out. What was your reaction? You know, you wrote a great article at The Athletic. uh, If if everybody hasn't read it yet, it's White Sox clean house, but does it change anything if Jerry Reinsdorf is still there? What was your reaction to the news that the White Sox fired Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn. I wasn't surprised at all. And I really do think that, um, you know, what I, what that headline said really expressed it. I don't write the headlines, right? Editors write the headlines, writers write the content, but I, I mean, that was my sort of immediate reaction was, I mean, yeah, this team's kind of been adrift for a while, but I've heard stories for years of the dysfunction across the front office and it comes from the top, you know, and to me, it was my, my sense was that it was a lot of Reinsdorf and it was a lot of Kenny Williams. And they don't really know how to separate the two. Obviously if Ken, if Reinsdorf went to Kenny Williams and said, knock it off, right. That's the end of that. So clearly mm-hmm. Reinsdorf on some level was endorsing Williams involvement in areas where, Maybe he should have been just less involved, especially after he was no longer the GM. And then also there are situations where we know Reinsdorf was directly interfering. And so I look at the further down you go, the less culpable people seem to me. Like a lot of people want to pile on Rick Hahn. I don't really have an issue with Rick Hahn. I think he did his job with one hand tied behind his back for 10 years. I look at the parade of scouting directors we saw, the amateur scouting directors. Those guys never had autonomy in the draft. Even after my article ran, I kept, I heard more stories from former White Sox mm-hmm. people about, uh, you know, they were going to sign such and such a player who turned into a you know, top 100 prospect and a big leaguer for another organization. And that didn't happen because somebody stood up in the draft room and said, I'm quitting unless we take Steel Walker here and uh, and so on. I mean, those mm-hmm. those stories abound so the further you get down from the top the less responsibility i place the thing is the guy at the very very top is still there and seems pretty unrepentant about his role in all of this which is why i say hey look i hope for better things i like chris gets i'm hopeful he'll get more autonomy and be able to just do his job but i'm not that sanguine about it either what do you like about Chris Guest? Because you mentioned in the comments of your post that like you're somewhat bullish on the individual. Um, yeah. he, so I guess let's separate him best we can from what the White Sox do and what they are. Like, what do you like about Chris Getz, the person? I think he's um, I mean, he's very personable, and that doesn't make you a good GM. I've known a lot of nice guys who are not good GMs, obviously, but it doesn't hurt. And he's a modern thinker. He is curious. He's open minded. Uh, he is reasonably versed in the data in which we are all swimming and uh, particularly the philosophies around that data. I guess anybody can see the data, but he he has under he understands a good bit of what teams are trying to do with analytics, with research and development at this point. 
And I think with pretty limited resources, he was at least making an effort. Um, and that was sometimes visible on the player development side. Like you, you can't develop if you don't have the right players in the system. And I, I detailed a lot of that in the article. But trying things, he was trying to do a lot of things differently than anybody who I think had been in those that position before, going back probably 10, 15 or more years in the organization. And I do think when you enter a situation like that, where things uh, things were stagnant in a lot of areas, but in player development over there, probably more than anywhere, to come in and shake things up, kick a hole in the wall. Like, I have no problem with someone coming in and trying something a little out there. Like I think the idea at the end of last season of running everybody to Birmingham and just let's get all our better prospects in one spot. I, I don't know that that was a good or a bad idea, but it was a pretty clear signal to people. We're, we're not just doing the same old thing again, because the same old thing hasn't worked. They just haven't developed players going back a really long time. You would know that better than anyone on our side. I think you've, you know, I don't know how you keep a blog going when <laughs> there's so, so little to talk about on the minor league side. And, and it, so I, and, and then the last thing I'll say about Chris is he's one of my primary points of contact when um, I talk to somebody from every organization, at least one person, each offseason when I'm doing my team by team lists. And so he's been my main point of contact talking to them about their own system. And I find him to be insightful. I find him to be realistic. Um, and I think when he highlights player strengths and weaknesses, they generally check out. They either align with things I've seen and heard myself or going forward when I see those players or hear more about those players, they tend to check out. And I, I did get a lot of, or see a lot of comments from readers sort of killing guts saying, you know, our system sucks. And to me, it does come back to what I wrote in the article, which is that's not on him. There just hasn't been enough talent coming into the system. And we have point to a few individual player development failures, certainly if, if you may want to talk about that. But I think on the whole, the mediocre draft results and the really poor international free agency results that's why the system is in bad shape. And I don't think you know, if you want to give gets an incomplete rather than giving him a positive grade, that's fine. He hasn't had a ton to work with though. And I think that's the most realistic way to assess his body of work so far since he joined the White Sox. I think there are a couple main reasons for uh, disenchantment among White Sox fans with Getz specifically. One is that mm -hmm. Reinsdorf said, uh, introducing Getz, that he did not interview anybody else. And so basically to White Sox fans and me watching is like, he's the best that we have. We didn't try, you know, it's a very lazy hiring process, which does him no favors. And so he had to do a press conference basically uh, after he was introduced as the default selection. So uh, there's that. There's also the matter that like gets his experience before the White Sox came with the Royals. Pedro mm -hmm. Grafal's experience before the White Sox came with the Royals. Pedro mm -hmm. Grafal's coaches were with the Royals. There's rumors that he might bring in <laughs> Dayton Moore with the Royals. So like why, you know, one, is there anything about the Royals that makes them somebody to emulate and absorb? And two, like how much should we be fixating uh, on the lack of just interest and curiosity on Jerry Reinsdorf's part on other front office people who are now gone uh, just around the league and what the league is doing. So there's a lot to unpack there in a good way, certainly. Um, I will just start by putting one part to bed. The fact, other than Dayton Moore, who who was a decision maker with the Royals, and who I think qualifies as somebody who I think is a very very nice person, like somebody I would you know, be you know if he were a close friend, he'd be the type you depend on for anything. Like he is that guy, and the loyalty he engenders in his employees, I think, really speaks to that. His track record with the Royals was pretty mixed, mm -hmm. um, particularly after they won the World Series. They just never succeeded in rebuild. They hung on too long, and every attempt, everything they tried to do to build a second time, just none of it's worked, and the, the organization is still really struggling in the aftermath of that. That said, everyone else coming from the Royals, to me, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't really mm – because -hmm. we've seen plenty of people come from mediocre organizations then have success somewhere else. Um, or, you know, I always go back to the Terry Francona example where he was like kind of a lousy manager for a not great Philadelphia team and then goes to Boston. He's a genius. Um, and it turned out he just needed the experience and he needed to get into the right system. So Chris Getz can certainly set the tone for the entire organization – for better or for worse, it's very much on him now. Uh, you know, hopefully he's given uh, more autonomy than his predecessor, but he can 
set free maybe if he's got really talented people that have come from Kansas City or wherever. He can create an environment where they can do more, where they can show that maybe they were underutilized with Kansas City. That part doesn't bother me very much. The thing you brought up about them not going outside the organization does bother me on multiple levels. I talk about this a lot with managerial hires. Like the guy who just happened to be standing next to your manager when you fired him, it's probably not the best choice, right? And this mm -hmm. is nothing against Chris at all. It's just, you didn't look. You didn't go out there and look for the best possible candidate. And yeah, that's a concern. That is a concern beyond any individual person. It's just really unlikely that you happen to have the best possible candidate just sitting there in the next office. Um, it's also, I have to say, a concern just from a DEI perspective this is something I talk about a lot. We don't have a lot of people who aren't white men in senior positions in Major League Baseball. And in this case, the White Sox actually fired one of the few who's held GM positions or higher anywhere in a Major League front office. And so, you know, they've actually moved down. Their their DEI meteor has actually gone down a little bit. And I think they have work to do to, to try to address that. When you don't do an outside search, you don't have to abide by Major League Baseball's guidelines on interviewing candidates from underrepresented groups. And they didn't do that. They just hired you know, nothing against Chris. But they hired the white guy who happened to be standing there. And that's not great from a system perspective, from the Major League Baseball as a whole. I certainly don't like Seeing that, and I don't think that is the best way from as somebody who just believes also diversity is good for organizational health and progress and creativity, it's also not the best way to go about it. That's a Reinsdorf problem. Again, this is everything <laughs> just comes back to there's a really old guy who has a death grip on the organization and won't let go. And even though he's got very little success to point to himself, I just wonder when Jerry looks in the mirror, does he say, I'm really good at this? Like, no, actually, you're pretty clearly not. And you would be much better off and probably happier and more successful if you just hired the best possible people and let them do their jobs. And I think that's pretty consistent across baseball. I can't speak to other sports where you know, most of the better organizations, the owners just stay out of stuff. They hire the best GMs or presidents of baseball ops and say, go do what you do best. I will do what I do best, which is just owning the team. I provide the capital. You provide the brains. There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. They show you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWireSports. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash BlueWireSports. That's indeed.com slash blue wire sports and support the show by saying that you heard it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash blue wire sports. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Yeah, the problem is Reinsdorf makes it sound like he has no other hobbies. So we yeah. are subject to, like, I'm not good at guitar. I like playing guitar, but I don't subject other people to listen to me try to play the guitar. We right. have to all watch Reinsdorf struggle and struggle and struggle to get something right. Like he's trying to be a decision maker while not being mm -hmm. a decision maker and it, and it goes very poorly. But speaking of him, I had, there was one quote that he said that kind of uh, a chill just ran one. up my spine. Yeah. <laughs> well, just one in particular, as it pertains to Getz. Uh, Reinsdorf said, for the first time in all the years that I've been associated with the White Sox, I had a farm director who was doing what I wanted. So does that mean I, I can, I can, you know, read this two ways. One, like that's just something he's saying Two, sure. does that mean that gets is a yes man or does he come across as a yes man in this regard? If, or, or is he good at fooling Reinsdorf into thinking that yeah. he's listening to what he's saying? I mean, that to me is the, it, it just reminds me, there was an interview in the New York times with the fail son of the Orioles, John Angelos, where mm -hmm. Angelos repeated this claim that if we sign somebody to a long-term deal, we're going to be so far financially underwater, and there's no pushback, no follow-up question, or no just saying, hey, that's 
that's just wrong. And we know it's wrong. You're just flat mm-hmm. out lying to me. Now, in Reinsdorf's case, I, I'm not, it's not quite to that level, but there's got to be a follow up there, right? Why? What is it? He took no that questions. Chris was doing <laughs> right. Of course not. Of yeah, course yeah. he didn't. Yeah. Right. And, and but I would. I really want to know. I'm not saying that this is impossible, but what is it about Chris's tenure running the farm? That you that you really liked. Give us some concrete examples, and you could talk about specific players. You could talk about specific processes. I don't know. I mean, you you can very clearly point to this White Sox farm system and say, "There's been a whole lot coming out of there the last couple mm-hmm. of years." The players they have, the rookies, the good rookies, uh, and prospects who've come out of this system have started elsewhere and generally become finished products. Uh, or been close to finished products before the White Sox got them. And I think one of the better examples of a guy who got better with the White Sox, Lucas Giolito, he did it on his own. Now, he, he mm-hmm. will, I, I've talked to Lucas in the past too, and he, he praised the White Sox pitching coach quite a bit also, but he did a lot of that work himself. And so I would say, where, what are your success stories? Whether it's individual players or processes, tell me what it is what am what am I not seeing? Because I even look at the White Sox system today, and I talked to two pro scouts who had the White Sox system who came back with really negative reports. It was funny. One right before the article ran, another one saw the article and said, "You don't know the half of it." Um, <laughs> and both of them really buried the White Sox first round pick from this year, Jacob Gonzalez. Which oh, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, it's not, well, we can talk about that at length. It's, it's it's not good, certainly. So again, the question: any of your explanations for Reindorf's quote could be true, but we have no idea because right now that's just sort of some empty rhetoric from an owner mm-hmm. who I think pretty much decided to do what he was going to do. And he's just going to say whatever to try to justify. And I have a really hard time with that. I'm never the person in those press conferences um, because it's just not part of the job, but there's mm-hmm. definitely a little part of me that wants to be the guy who just like, mm-hmm. can I just have budget to just fly to these press conferences and say, excuse me, <laughs> Excuse me, that's not true. Or mm-hmm. in this case, like, what the heck are you talking about? What does that yeah. mean? What you wanted? Why do I think what you, an owner with more failure than success on your ownership resume, you what what you want in a farm director? What is what part of that is a good idea? Why should I think that's reassuring? The hell do you know about running a farm system? I would like an answer to that question. I doubt we're going to get one. Well, like the, I took that quote out of context because I thought the context didn't really help. <laughs> I was writing about it. <laughs> like the context, what he went on to say, like that Getz has done a good job teaching the game of baseball and just kind of old school, older fan stuff. But like when you watch what the White Sox prospects do when they come aboard, like mistakes abound. Like Oscar Colas in right field has been a mess, <laughs> just out of control. Yep you know, whether it's decisions, whether it's just kind of like how he composes himself approaching a ball, fielding it, like all over the place, like Zach Remillard uh, comes up, gets a lot of praise from Grafal for playing the game the right way, which I took as a shot across the bow for veterans and other, you know, younger players who yeah. are not doing it the right way. And it's just like everything we've seen, everything Grafal has said, and Grafal is staying with Getz, like, you know, he's he's in for next year. He's been saying, yeah. like, these guys don't know how to play baseball. The Orioles broadcast was roasting the White Sox for their performance yeah. in the first inning. And, like, there's a rundown where it's a pretty simple thing. And, like, Kevin Brown said, let's see if they get this one right. Like, that's kind of how you're, you know. <laughs> for which John roasted. Angelo suspended Kevin for the rest of the season. Yeah, I'm no, sure. it was. It was, yes. He was slamming the White Sox, so he got a, probably a raise. Oh, uh, okay. That's okay, then. Yes. But, you know, so when you see that, like, that's why I lifted that quote from the context, because, like, there's no real evidence that the White Sox are playing baseball any better since he came aboard. So I just kind of took that as meaningless. And, but that's kind of what makes me I, think, like, I don't know, what, is Getz just saying one thing to Reinsdorf and doing another or what? And, you know, then you get back to this sort of where does the where does this start, right? Are they also not bringing in young players or they bring in young players who don't have particularly good instincts, don't have particularly good feel for the game. Like I do think that's been true, particularly on the international side, thinking of the guys they've signed. I mean, Micker Adolfo is probably the, the best slash worst example ever where a White Sox executive at the time said, this guy, this guy actually doesn't know how to play baseball. We be, we just signed a workout guy. And it, to me, it's impressive. Adolfo got as far as he did on just few, mm. pure physical talent. Especially um, with all the injuries. With all the injuries and go, guys who saw him that first year he was in the AZL, which a lifetime ago, were you know, the scouts came back, was like, you know, if I'm just grading him on tools, right? This guy looks like a star. He has no idea what he's doing at all. And 
he's the worst example, but they went after a lot of those guys. And there's a little bit of that in the draft too, where it seemed very all or nothing. I think they take the most uninspiring, low ceiling college guy, Nick Madrigal, right? Nick Madrigal can, re- he really knows how to play baseball. He's just not very good at it, but he knows how. <laughs> and so well, they take those guys or yeah. they would take the guys who were sort of all tools, all upside. Who's the kid? Um, James Beard. Mm-hmm. One of my favorites, just because he shares the name, obviously, with the famous chef and food writer, mm-hmm. uh, famous food writer, I should say. But, um, you yeah, know, James Beard was an 80 runner at least. And turned out he really didn't know how to play baseball. And so and they they didn't have any under any player development regime. They had no skill in developing those guys. No, absolutely no demonstrated ability of taking those guys who were all tools, all upside, no feel often no real knowledge of how to play and turning them into major leaguers at least. So yeah, that's the, those quotes are certainly concerning. I'm not going to bury gets as a result, but well, bury Reinsdorf for them. Certainly like that's, yeah. he said them and I don't yeah. know what he's talking about. Yeah. The tough thing with like, you know, talking about promoting a director of player development, you know, slash now assistant GM, now at the GM at a time like this is, you know, we're talking about development and it hasn't been there and his, title is director of player development. So I think that's what makes this tough to, to square up. And, you know, when you talk about like the rankings, the White Sox, ever since graduating the Jimenez, Moncada, Giolito, Lopez cluster that they got from the rebuild, got from outside has been pretty much, yeah, yeah, pretty much in the low twenties until now, because they traded away Giolito and Lopez and Lance Lynn and such. So now it's back to the middle. So in between uh, the pipeline that Rick Hahn wanted to build never developed. And so like how much of that is maybe, you know, in this case, like Chris Katz's responsibility, but just in general, how much does a ranking of a system reflect on a player development director? Much less than it reflects on the amateur director or directors an international director or directors. Look, I think a director of player development can do a lot of good and he can do a lot of harm, certainly, but he is very much at the mercy of what players are given to him. Um, and, you know, and I detailed, I think more than anything, the problems in the White Sox draft rooms where this went across multiple scouting directors, which says to me, it's not the scouting director's problem. It's the system in which they're working. And I know from a lot of people who used to work with the White Sox too, plenty of situations where the scouting director wanted to take one guy and someone else, Kenny, Rick, Jeremy Haber was involved in one of these stories I heard where they were essentially told, no, can't take the guy, got to take somebody else instead. And ultimately, player development, I don't care. You could be the Dodgers player development people, and they have several over there who who are involved. You know, they could go hire Will Rimes away from the Dodgers. You give him the same set of players, he's not going to create Dodgers-like results. There's only so much you can do when you're just given less to work with in the first place. And so I think it would be fair to say, since Chris Getz became director of player development, who did they really develop? It's it's not a great list, right? Mm-hmm. But I also would then turn around and say, who should they have developed and they didn't? I will offer my one big criticism, which is that they've taken they they took a couple of high school pitchers in 19 and 20 in particular, um, and gave some money to those guys. I'm thinking Thompson, Dahlquist, Kelly, Kelly. I may be forgetting someone. McDougal, Kelly was, but he's been injured. He's just got back from Tommy. He's been hurt. Yes. And we'll see. Hopefully he he pans out. But you could say of those big three, at least, setting McDougal aside, it's a lot of money for zero results. And I mean, none of those guys have even come close to developing since then. All right. Maybe this is not a core competence. Maybe we're not good at those developing those guys. Maybe we shouldn't have drafted that type of guys. On the other hand, it was pretty nice to see them open it up and say, hey, we're going to take some you know higher upside High school pitching. Now, really, Thompson, I actually saw him horrible that spring, but he was really interesting because he was very athletic and could show you two pitches, the delivery work, the kind of – and he wasn't a first-round pick, so it was the kind of guy saying, it's nice to see the White Sox take a little more risk here to go for a little more reward, and it get absolutely nothing out of any of those three guys. That's a fair question. I mean, it's something mm-hmm. I would – if I were having an on-the-record conversation with Chris, I'd say – it seems like one thing, one situation where you were given some guys to really develop, where they didn't develop was with these high school pitchers. What have you learned from that? Is there anything you think you would do differently if you take some of those guys again in the future, if you're allowed to change who the types of players you're going after in the draft? And what would you do differently to try to develop those guys? Or would you just say, we're going to stay away from that class of player because we don't think we're good at developing them? 
Does somebody like Andrew Vaughn, who just simply doesn't walk anymore, does he yeah. fall under that? Or is it a case of just that's where the White Sox had plans for Vaughn and gets more or less had to stay out of the way? I mean, Vaughn wasn't in the minors very much, right? Yeah. What did he have that for that one summer? And then he Alternate was basically... training sites. Yeah, which is, I don't know many stories of guys who got better at those. Uh, Jaron Duran is one with the Red Sox. He pops into mind as somebody who I heard he was, he got much better at the alternate site. And then when he showed up the next year, he was in fact much better. There are not many of those stories. Okay. I mean, Vaughn was just, he wasn't in the system very long. Mm -hmm. And the four, one year he was in the minors or the half year after he was drafted, he walked. And this guy walked quite a bit in the in uh, college too. I seemed like that was getting on base rather than just walking. Getting on base was going to be his carrying tool or skill, however you want to characterize it. And that's just kind of gone. And I am I'm really flummoxed. I mean, he's 25 now. At mm -hmm. what point do you just say this is probably what he is? I mean, I think he's sort of marginally having a you know, he's having a slightly better year overall mm -hmm. than he's had. Uh, it's not super, it's not terribly exciting. Like this is certainly not third pick in the draft, right? This is not what you thought you were getting. And yeah. I did say, somebody asked in the comments, I said, you know, I wonder if just rushing into the majors just kind of screwed everything up. I mean, you think he would recover at some point, year three. He's not mm -hmm. fighting for his professional life anymore, his major league life. And he's kind of the same player he's been for three solid years now. And that's not very, uh, that's certainly not promising. And you know, but, but that's not a Chris Getz player development. That's also on the major league staff. You know, the major league coaches have been the ones who've worked with him for about 400 games now. And we haven't really seen, I would say we've seen zero progress in the player in going from when Vaughn, let's say middle of his first year until mm -hmm. now, I don't think he's improved at all as a player. I don't know if he's regressed, but he certainly hasn't come close to the player. He was supposed to be a player. I certainly thought he was going to be when they drafted him. And yeah, the other specific, uh, point I had with Getz uh, of, of criticism and, and um, displeasure was the way, you know, and, and this is why I want to ask you about when it comes to minor league managers, hiring and firing, who's there, who gets promoted, who gets bumped up, who, you know, in a normal system, who has responsibility over that? Is that the purview of the director of player development? Because with the White Sox, with Omar Vizquel, some ghastly allegations against him, uh, Wes Helms had lesser misconduct issues, but was also fired. Helms was promoted from Birmingham to Charlotte during the point of this. Uh, and Helms is mentioned in the lawsuit as somebody who witnessed uh, the misconduct on uh, alleged misconduct on Viscal's part. So like, you know, Helms stayed and then he got promoted and then he got fired the next year. So when it comes to like this stuff, how much of that is gets, how much of that is in a typical system, how much of White, uh, I should say, like minor league managers going up and down, coming to the system, leaving the system is on the director of player development. In a normal organization, the director of player development or VP of player development, what, whoever's on top of that department is making those hiring and firing decisions and promotion decisions and so on. I don't know if that's what actually happened with the White Sox, because I kind of assume Jerry and, and maybe Kenny on his own or as a proxy for Jerry have been involved in a lot of those decisions. And um, so I don't know how to parcel out blame or responsibility or credit if it were due anywhere here, but I don't really think we're talking about that. But that is mm -hmm. um, that should be under the player development director's purview. And he's also responsible for evaluating those people too. And, and he's responsible for setting processes and strategy and philosophy for the entire department and making sure, say, everyone's on the same page. You now have five, six minor league affiliates if you count the DSL, and you'd like to have a consistent voice when in terms in terms of things like hitting philosophies, pitching development philosophies. You don't have to all be doing exactly the same things, but you certainly want when a player moves up from one level to the next, he's hearing fairly consistent things from his coach. He's not hearing contradictory things. In bad mm -hmm. organizations, you get a lot of that every man for himself among the coaches or coaches who want to put their stamp on guys specifically. And that's where a lot of the stories come of prospects who look pretty promising and then got derailed at some point. I don't really know the answer of what was going on with the White Sox. I don't know who was making those decisions. When I see a famous guy like Vizquel end up in the system, my immediate thought is, oh, Jerry did that. I don't know mm -hmm. that that, I don't know I, actually at all. That just sounds like him to hire somebody like that. He likes to hire his friends, people he knows. Like he likes to hire Tony Larusa. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll try to do it one more time. And that's, you know, it, that may be unfair of me. I may just be uh, biased in the way that I'm blaming Jerry for a lot of bad decisions that weren't actually his. But he's got a little bit of a track record of that, too. So I don't think I'm 100% unjustified in thinking that. Yeah, I think with Getz, like, the one thing I hold him, I guess, accountable for that we can see is that when Vizquel is fired, he flattered Vizquel on the way out, said he was a positive influence on the clubhouse when he was here. And then, yeah. so I don't think he is a monster necessarily, <laughs> but I do think it showed his inexperience with like HR matters of being like an administrator as much mm -hmm. as a, you know, uh, as much as a former player who knows something about baseball. And so like from him, you know, the, the phrase among White Sox fans is failing upward and it's, Hard to shake right now with just how little he's shown or how little he's been allowed to show. And that's, I think that's the tension here. And if you're holding out hope, it's a matter of like what he's been allowed to do versus what actually he's capable of. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair. I, I, I do think Getz ends up in the GM job as a bit of a cipher to all of us because he moved kind of quickly through the system. Um, and so much of, we have very little to point to in terms of decisions that were clearly his, right? That's the number one um, thing I would tend to look for when someone is hired to be any of these positions. Um, if you've had some decision-making authority previously, okay, great. What were your decisions? And mm -hmm. maybe we can evaluate them and understand not every decision, most decisions are not made in a vacuum, but we can at least start on that basis. Um, in his case, we have very little of that. And I do think the confounding factor here is that there just wasn't a lot of talent coming into the system. And, um, you know, do you want to give him credit for Colson Montgomery turning into, you know, maybe a star? Sure. You could also argue he was a first rounder and he probably should be this kind of player. And also that's just one. That's really mm -hmm. like, I keep thinking about the White Sox system. And I, I, in, in my mind, the White Sox system is like Colson Montgomery and dot, dot, dot. And that is part of why I find it hard to talk about Chris in a more evidence-based manner. I end up relying a little bit more on my, my personal experience with him, which has been very positive and which does give me the sense that he is an intelligent guy who is curious and forward thinking and will if allowed, put some new processes in place and change the direction of the organization. But I completely understand anyone's skepticism because I'm basing that on like, some very personal interactions that don't really, even to me, feel much like data. I like data, and I don't know that we have a lot of data on Chris. <laughs> yeah, to me, it feels like the White Sox rushing up a prospect. Uh, you know, like say like Courtney. Oh, they Hawkins never do that. Or, what are you talking yeah, about? Carson Fulmer, et cetera. I'm just like, he has <laughs> some skills. Let's we have him on timetable. Let's get him up there and hope he uh hope he survives. But uh to go back to a loose end that we had earlier, Jacob Gonzalez, uh, what's the deal? It, I'm getting a lot of um and I, you know, I saw him early in the spring. I was like, this guy looks pretty good, like a very solid, high floor college player. And as the season went on, the batted ball data was not terribly impressive and the scouting looks were also not that great. He had, he did have his best season, I think overall or close to it. He had a really good, or at least I'd say a really solid season for Mississippi, but in a year with a lot of higher upside college position players, he didn't really stand out. And the white Sox, I mean, when they took him, it's this, I thought this feels like a very white Sox pick. And I don't mean that in a positive way. And it feels very much like a, like the time that they were supposedly told from above, you got to take Jake Berger, um, you know, who's had a nice year, but certainly not a difference maker for, I think, the 11th pick in the draft. Or you know, they mm -hmm. took Zach Collins, another one where it was like, you're pretending he can catch. And it turned out they were pretending he could hit. He couldn't do either of those things. In Gonzalez's case, I don't think he's a bust. I'm certainly not calling a guy a bust off 27 professional games, but multiple scouts have come back to me and said, they don't really see any kind of upside. It's not a great approach. It's not great bat speed. It's certainly not power. It is not a ton of defensive value. And then I look at some of the guys they passed on, Braden Taylor, Brock Wilkin, you know, Andy Morales, who they were rumored to be on, the last one in particular. And I think at one point I had connected them to Taylor. Those guys are off, all up to way better starts. They were arguably better players in college. Certainly Taylor was. Was and Matt they're all Shaw doing before much or after? He was before. Or 4K. It was my guy. I was a big Matt Shaw fan. Yeah. I thought he belonged in the top 10. And we'll see. So far, so good. Um, he went two picks before the White Sox, I think. I think it was Shaw, so, yeah. Kyle Teal, and then Gonzalez. And, you know, 
what did I have Gonzalez 25th on my board or something? And he goes 15th. So it's not like that's some raging overdraft. It's who they passed on mm-hmm. in that cluster of college position players. They passed on guys who looked better at the time and who have had better professional debuts in a tiny sample. Obviously, we'll see how this goes next year. But the fact that he's in low A and not really hitting, which is, I would argue, a lower caliber of overall competition than what he was facing, at least on the weekends in the SEC, and that other guys like Taylor, Wilkin, Morales are in high A, or even you've got guys like Shaw and Dylan Cruz in double A, who are all performing, it makes Gonzalez look a little bit worse by comparison. So is it a matter of the looks being surprisingly bad because the White Sox made changes or is it just the same guy in a different context being like, Oh, he doesn't look the same or he doesn't, he's not making, he doesn't look like an impact player. He doesn't look like an impact player. That's really the biggest thing. Okay. Um, To me, that is, Hey, this guy is not, it's not great bat speed. He's not impacting the ball a ton. It's not an impact defender. Now, look, they, he also played all spring. Then, you know, these guys, because the draft is so late, he's got a fair amount of time off and he's got to ramp back up he could come back next spring and look a lot better. I am far from just burying this guy. And I think some White Sox fans who saw my article thought I one said, why you essentially, why are you calling him a bust? I'm not. He could still turn out to be a solid regular in the big leagues. Multiple people are coming back to me though and saying, this guy's that that's his ceiling, right? And an everyday player is probably the best you can hope for. 15th pick in a really loaded draft with some guys who went behind him who have more upside. That's the part I'm I'm saying you could be upset about. You could, but, but that's you should have been upset the day they took him because they passed on better players. So this is just confirming evidence that confirms impressions that I and I think other people also had on the day of the draft. So the White Sox stress that gets is the single decision maker. Do you think if that holds, and if Reinsdorf isn't the second decision maker who goes uh, uncredited. Um, do you think that will resolve a fair amount of just the issues that make the White Sox the White Sox? If they, if Jerry really does just stay the heck out of it, then I'm much more optimistic, right? I would really, I would be optimistic about Chris Getz as GM with autonomy, actually allowed to make more significant changes. Um, And it's philosophical. It's not people. Like, I don't think he needs to turn around and fire a scouting director. I think he needs to let, you know, Shirley go and just draft, take the players he really wants without interference. Like, let your guy, you have a scouting staff and you have R&D guys. Like, let them develop their process, develop whether it's a model-based or or a more subjective system. Let them do their job without that kind of interference from from above, really. I mean, my understanding is at least sometimes this was coming from Kenny Williams, uh, maybe not directly from Reinsdorf, but just any system where you you, you take a, a smart guy who is curious and just say, go do what you think is best. Put your strategy, your philosophy into place. It may take time, mm-hmm. um, but I am much more optimistic if that's the case. I'm also not optimistic that Jerry's going to stay out of it because they're going to lose 90 plus games next year, kind of no matter what. And what if Jerry just gets itchy? He says they don't have a year to spare. That's nice. That's very, (laughs) that's nice. That's, I, if you can explain to me where they're going to find 82 wins next year, I would love to hear it. Four pitchers, I don't think, yeah, right? I mean, there might be 82 wins in Chicago. They're just on the North side. Or total. (laughs) (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, okay. So we've been spending a lot of time just wallowing, I think. So let's end on a high (laughs) note here. What's one thing about in the White Sox system, you know, aside from Colson Montgomery, that Mm -hmm. you like what's going on or you like what somebody's doing just so we can end on a little bit of a palate cleanser here? No, God, you took away the guy, right? How can I talk about, right? Um, You know, look, I've, I have liked Brian Ramos for a while. I think we're continuing to see progress from him. God, it would be really nice to see them actually develop a, um, a particular position player signed as an international free agent for who six gets figures. to the majors. Yeah, for six figures, right? Who gets to the majors with an approach, right? One of their own guys who gets to the majors. And it's like, oh, there's some ball strike recognition here and some pitch recognition. And I mean, that's the thing with Colas is he just doesn't pick up off speed stuff well at all. It's why he wasn't on my top 100 coming into the season. Ramos 
seems to have a bit of that. And it looks like it's sustained with, you know, he's moved up to double A where the pitching is better. And, you know, he's got, he's done a lot of his damage against lefties, which is, you know, I mean, a huge amount of his damage against lefties. And that's, you know, would love to see a little bit more balance there. But also the fact that he's making a lot of contact against right-handed pitching is a positive thing. There's some, there's some hope there um, that he's going to pan out. But I got to say, like, it, the system is thin. I mean, t- saying I can't talk about Colson Montgomery is you just tied one of my own hands behind my back, unfortunately. So Edgar Caro, like how are you feeling about his? I do. Yes, say so, you know, I, I, I should just say in general, I liked the trades. I think they did reasonably well in a difficult situation where they were trading, you know, impending free agents, a lot of whom had not had their best years. And so the value was probably even a little bit lower. I'm a Caro guy. I think he takes time. That is not a guy I want to see rush to the majors. He's 20. Um, when I last saw him, is it the spring? I guess he was, I saw him once this summer also, but he's kind of physically underdeveloped, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. Really, I think the ball strike recognition in the approach is very real. I think power, you know, he hit 17 homers, but in a great, you know, in the Cal League last year. And then the Angels, for some ridiculous reason, jumped him up from low A to double A. Who knows why the Angels do what they do. They, uh, I think Edgar Caro is going to turn into an above average regular behind the plate. But it wouldn't surprise me if it was three or four years before we got to that point. And I hope the White Sox being in the position they're in just say, we're going to take our time. He's going to finish this year at double A. He's going to spend most of next year in triple A. And then maybe he comes to the majors, but we're easing him in. Like, Just keep the expectations. You can have your long-term expectations a little higher, but mm-hmm. you can't. But I hope they give him time. This is, And this you mentioned that the White Sox, have they've rushed prospects. Let's hope that that is also behind us at this point because i think they have i don't know if i'd say they've ruined but they've certainly diminished the prospects of some of their prospects by doing that well thank you so much for your time this has been really enlightening and i think it helps round out our conversation a little bit and i hope that this doesn't use up our allowances of keith law appearances on the podcast will you come on in february <laughs> march etc to talk about prospects or have we of used course you up? No, no, you haven't used me up. We can talk about Caro, Montgomery, Ramos, and Nick Destrini. And we'll, we'll have plenty of guys to discuss. Um, I mean, I'd say good things about all of them, but that's not because I hate the White Sox, it's just because I hate everybody. <laughs> well, great. And hopefully I'll have some Chris uh, Getz evidence to talk about as well. That would be great. I would love to. I hope we have some of that myself, that we have some, maybe at that point, we'll have some major league transactions at that point. At least we'll be able to break those down. All right. Thanks again. You're welcome. That's Keith Law. It's always great talking to him, and you can be sure I'll bother him after he posts his White Sox prospects list next year. In the meantime, you can find him at The Athletic and on Twitter and other social networks at Keith Law. If you are new to the Sox Machine podcast, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear and want to support what we do, you can do so at patreon.com slash Sox Machine, where you can get an ad-free version of the site and show with bonus content. Plans start at $2 a month with savings on an annual plan. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Jim Margulis. Thanks for listening.